since it is so difficult to get to the, the snake to wind around the feet just right. We are duly impressed and remark on its beauty and uniqueness. We never seen any beat like this at the other workshops. Uh, how did he come to make something so, so innovative? He says he started out just making traditional designs, but then started innovating, uh, first by making the traditional designs more attractive, uh, playing with different color combinations and shifting patterns. Though he changes the colors and patterns, the meanings and stories are still there. But for this bead, he started with the traditional stories and wondered how he could make those stories into new beads. I asked him, is it traditional? No, traditional beads are those copied from the old people, the old designs, but this innovative bead uh, does, make, does invoke traditional stories. Is it ind indigenous? Yes. In a discussion of how cultural objects enter into the commercial realm, uh, much of the att in attention tends to focus on the role of the consumer in influencing the styles and types of objects available for purchase. Indeed, the indigenous artists I studied frequently mentioned the necessity of making crafts that were smaller and priced lower so that tourists would be enticed to buy them and be able to carry them home easily. When I asked one weaver whether she had any clothing or larger pieces for sale, as she had when I had first visited years earlier, she said that she hadn't had any time to make these pieces since she was too busy making smaller crafts. So while she did weave large pieces, she then cut these up into smaller pieces and sewed them into small items that would be more likely to sell. And you can see an example like these little pouches or a book cover here. Other crafters also mentioned that they, as well as their customers, wanted things that were actually useful in their daily lives today. This often meaning things like purses and cell phone accessories. Yet despite shaping crafts to suit these particular desires of customers, crafters still maintain their own particular aesthetic influenced by their cultural background. And they are adamant that they like all of the things they make. It is very difficult to get anyone to say they have a preference, which is something I tried to do when I was doing the collections. If they didn't like it, they wouldn't make it. When asked about the designs of their pieces, crafters primarily pointed first to the utility of the form, for contemporary lifestyles, as well as the marketability of particular styles currently popular with customers. However, they also speak excitedly about the moment of inspiration and the process of realizing their ideas in the production of specific designs. These inspirations come from a variety of sources, including uh, original cultural patterns, cultural ideas, and even pulling directly from nature. Similar to classic Western narratives of artistic creation, Indigenous artists center their stories of the creative process around their own journey of discovery, but also emphasize the process of interaction with traditional designs and values, contemporary experience, and diverse influences from family, the artistic community, and nature. Their initial ideas are also often influenced by academic records, museum collections, and their own ethnographic research. So I begin this talk with a brief description of the contemporary situation of indigenous peoples in Taiwan uh, and the context within which these crafts are made. I then discuss the beginnings and impact of the cultural revitalization movement uh, in, on particular craft forms and how individual artists discuss these histories somewhat differently than the popular narratives. Next, I explore the variation and innovation of traditional forms within craft industries, focusing on the possibilities for innovation within an environment that also places a high value on conservation or preservation. By looking at a variety of craft workshops and types of crafts, I explore multiple ways of defining and portraying traditional meanings and designs. I then conclude with an exploration of how indigenous artists define creativity and perceive their own artistic practices and creations. I'm particularly interested in uncovering how their understandings of creativity relates to the construction of indigenous identity and ideas surrounding what counts as an indigenous object, practice, or quality. Right. So, the indigenous peoples of Taiwan are Austronesian speaking. Uh, populations believed to have migrated to the island beginning around 8,000 years ago, with subsequent waves of migration to the main island continuing up until to about 2,000 years ago, um, maybe later. Um, with, and the most recent arrivals would be the Tao on Lanyu Island, so down here, and I do not study them. <laughs> They're very different. Uh, currently, there are 14 nationally recognized tribes 
with a combined population of about half a million as of 2009, or roughly 2% of the population of Taiwan. Historically, they were categorized as plains and mountain dwelling tribes. Uh, you can see mountains, plains over here. So, and obviously these are, most of the tribes today are mostly mountain tribes. <clears throat> And until recently, it was believed that all the Plains tribes had been fully integrated with the surrounding Hopo or Hakka populations. Uh, while the distinction between Plains and Mountain tribes may be overemphasized, today it is certainly noticeable that the majority of indigenous tribes reside in remote and often difficult to manage areas. Net maps of indigenous populations today generally show them living on the spine created by the mountain range, running from the southern tip to northern tips of the island. None of these maps are very good, though, at demonstrating how different tribes live more interspersed with one another, giving a false sense of defined and exclusive boundaries. The remoteness of many tribes has been both a blessing and a difficulty to overcome. In early years, when settlers began arriving in greater numbers, the tribes moved further into the mountains and shipped to residents based on relations with both settlers and other tribes in the area. Um, during occupations of Taiwan by various governments, uh, being difficult to reach proved to be advantageous, allowing tribes to make themselves scarce when under threat and escaping much interference due to the difficulty of managing the areas where they lived. On the other hand, due to their continued difficulty to access and situation in areas of geologic instability, today indigenous people remaining in tribal villages have less access to public services, including health care, as well as educational and economic opportunities. So one of the challenges facing today's tribes is to find ways to improve their living conditions, including the creation of jobs while maintaining residence in these traditional territories. Although indigenous peoples maintained their connections to communities and their traditional territories, the economic pressures that came with their integration into the market economy and the discrimination outlined above in the last uh, half of the 20th century resulted in large migrations to urban centers for employment beginning in the 1970s. Uh, these migrants form new communities in the cities, particularly outside Taipei, uh, Taiwan, Kaohsiung, and Xinjiang. So most of Taipei's here. They became heavily involved in the indigenous rights movements with the lifting of martial law in 1987. Uh, the 1990s then saw the expansion of urban Aboriginal communities and the establishment of many businesses, such as restaurants, food stands, other commercial establishments um, that not necessarily indigenous themed. These urban indigenous workers face their own set of discriminations and hardships in comparison to the Taiwanese majority population, including higher unemployment rates, lower median incomes, higher concentrations in poorly paid manual labor jobs, uh, such as construction and agriculture. Um, and in an article on Aboriginal entrepreneurs, Scott Simon identifies at least two NGOs uh, which specifically assist Aboriginal artisans and entrepreneurs with classes, aid in marketing, and even small startup loans. And these are the ROC Taiwanese Aboriginal Handicraft Research and Development Association and the ROC Aboriginal Industry and Commerce Development Association. Uh, additionally, the Executive Viewing Council of Indigenous Peoples in cooperation uh, with the magazine Sea and Mountain Cultures has published a directory of these Aboriginal businesses in 1999. So indigenous individuals with interests in crafts may also receive promotional assistance or join a workshop supported by a number of religious organizations, including Catholic and Presbyterian ministries. Despite these initiatives, indigenous artists still have a difficult time breaking in, into and succeeding in the national craft market. And I won't be talking about the rest of the business side, I just wanted to give a brief overview. Uh, my research focused on indigenous craft workshops in and around Taidong City, and I left the map up here just to point out, this is Taidong, and this is the picture of the city, and this is nearby. It's a wonderful place to do the research. Um, the, it's the largest city in this remote section of the island and the only city in Taidong County with a total population of 110,000 and a sizable indigenous population of 15% of the total population of the city, while the total population of Taidong County is only 232,000 and one-third of that population is indigenous. So this is the largest concentration on the island. 
The surrounding area is home to many villages and indigenous tribes, including Amis, Kuyuma, who both have villages that fall within the urban sprawl of the city, and slightly further afield in more rural areas, there are the Rukai, the Paiwan, and the Boon. So this is, again, where the maps don't really do justice to how close they are. This purple section is supposed to be the Amis, and this is supposed to be the Kuyuma, but you'll be within the city and just go across the street and be right next to another tribe. However, for the collection of contemporary crafts for the Heffernover Museum of Anthropology, I visited workshops throughout the island uh, with artists representing the Atayal, Cedic, and Turoko in the north. So this is the Atayal area. It was around here, Turoko, here, <laughs> and Cedic in the mountains. Um, and then also collected in from the Paiwan and Rukai, so further down in this area in Kingdom County. The indigenous population of Taiwan is largely Christian, with significant Presbyterian, Methodist, and Catholic influences dating from the presence of the Dutch and Spaniards. Uh, while some generations experienced a pressure from the church to disdain traditional spiritual practices and their accompanying material culture, in more recent years in some communities, there has been a pushback to allow a more syncretic Christian practice that incorporates traditional motifs within church furnishings and even altars. And I just have pictures of the exteriors of some of these churches, which you can still see has some of these traditional practices, including designs here, and there's a carving that you can't really see as well, but it's a very elaborate wood carving. The tribes around Taidong City produce such crafts as shell leaf ginger plating, this one here, uh, basketry, pounded tree bark, she's preparing the bark here, wood and stone carving, pottery, and stitcher, um, beading, embroidery, and leather work. While they continue to produce crafts for themselves, many of the objects are sold at events or in gift shops to tourists or non-indigenous locals. Craft workshops range in size from an individual working out of their home to a cooperative with support from a governmental or religious organization. The majority of craft workers I work with are women, um, with some significant male bead makers and a predominance of men in carving as well as pottery. Around Taigong, textile plants, fiber crafts, and beads tend to be more prominent, with a little more effort needed to locate carvers and potters, though their work is often very visible uh, in restaurant stores and galleries and in public spaces. The indigenous crafts I discuss represent both traditional and contemporary material culture containing indigenous visual motifs, materials, or meanings. I categorize as crafts those things that the people I interviewed refer to as shogong iping, literally translated handmade art. These include attire, adornment, tools, decor, furnishings, things that are generally smaller and portable and therefore transferable. Uh, however, the distinction between craft and art remains hazy, particularly as many craftspeople are often involved in the production of many different kinds of arts and crafts at the same time, from small tourist pieces to traditional ceremonial objects to commission pieces for museums or galleries. Uh, something Lorraine Aragon discusses as a split economy, where the same people use the same production methods to make similar objects for both their own ritual or social use and for the market. So, I want to turn now to the, this cultural revitalization and give you a brief overview of how this played out. In the mid-20th century, with increasing stress placed upon indigenous communities from different religious influences, governmental regulations, and the shift to a capitalist economic model, many cultural traditions came under threat. Highly valued objects such as pylon and Rukai pottery and glass beads were sold to museums and collectors. As there was no local knowledge of how these pots and beads were made, many feared these sacred objects would be lost forever. Indigenous artists and intellectuals responded by conducting their own ethnographic and archival research, developing methods to produce new objects to replace those that were lost, and founding workshops and schools to pass on this knowledge and skill to tribal members. Beginning in the 1970s and gaining momentum through the 1980s and 1990s uh, with impetus from the National Indigenous Rights Movement and later support from the national government, this cultural re revitalization movement has brought about the emergence of indigenous craft industries throughout Taiwan and growing pride in indigenous identity. But talking about revitalization assumes that there was a serious disruption to a cultural group resulting in a loss of significant cultural materials and practices or at least the loss of interest in continuing these things. It suggests the threat to continuity and the need for active community participation 
to resist the constant threat from outside forces. And since all indigenous communities are viewed as threatened, any cultural activity seems to be viewed as a reaction, whether a resistance or acculturation. But many craft and practices have continued despite fears they would disappear among Taiwan's indigenous tribes, with some perceived disruptions only occurring for a short period of time before the next generation of young people uh, became interested or with noticeable disinclinations to continue in a few villages while others continue on and later serve as instructors for the newly interested individuals from communities where the practice had become less prevalent. Were these really crises of crafty practice? Did ind indigenous individuals experience these times of disruption? Um, for other crafts, crafting practices were either documented as lost relatively recently, such as the boon and so pottery or bark cloth for old tribes, except for the Amis who kind of still remembered how to make it but weren't making it, uh, or there was no record, written or oral, of the craft ever being made by the tribe, such as the pottery and glass beads of the Paiwan and Rukai, which is what I have a picture of here. These are all beads and one piece of pottery at least. What does it take to revitalize a craft where the practice is not yet known? How did crafters in the communities view these relearned or newly learned crafts in relation to traditional practice and materials? How are newly made objects and newly constructed practices integrated as part of the tribal culture, as being properly indigenous or even traditional? I want to turn now to recount the popular narrative cultural revitalization repeated both by news reports and academic articles. So after the retreat of the KMT to Taiwan and the establishment of martial law, indigenous peoples also saw further repression of their cultural practices and lifestyles and began to move in large numbers to urban centers to escape rural poverty. Here they experienced severe discrimination, employment opportunities, etc., etc. Uh, due to these harsh conditions, many indigenous individuals stopped using their native language, avoided wearing clothing that might differentiate them, and tried their best to simply blend in. However, with the democratic social movements of the 1980s, indigenous people centered in urban areas formed their own organizations to promote indigenous rights, as previously mentioned, and counter native stereotypes. This was led by Ichan Parad and Amis from Hualien. Um, he, he led a small group of indigenous college students at National Taiwan University, so this is up in Taipei, um, and gathered them with the writing association and members of the Taiwan Presbyterian Church and founded the Alliance of Taiwan Aborigines in 1984. By 1986, the organization shifted its focus from the redressal of individual grievances to collective struggle for ethnic autonomy, quote, ethnic autonomy, quote unquote. For the collective group of classification, they demanded to be called Yunjumi, or Aborigines, though this is also often translated as indigenous. Uh, this name was officially changed in 1994 by an amendment to the ROC Constitution. In response to the movement, the government also established the Council of Aboriginal Affairs in 1986. And this was then changed to the Council of Indigenous Peoples, uh, which was meant to represent the concerns of indigenous peoples to the central government. The movement was also effective in promoting and passing new legislation for education, labor, and the right to use indigenous names. Yet, despite these advancements, many problems still remained in the home villages which had been drained of young people seeking employment and better lives in the cities, leaving their children behind with aging grandparents. With their political victories achieved in the cities and often having attained their educational and economic goals, many indigenous activists started to turn their attention to their hometowns and began to search for ways to contribute to and improve the lives of tribal communities. Activists became especially concerned with cultural objects and practices which they feared were rapidly disappearing, and that once these things had disappeared, indigenous peoples would lose a substantial part of their identity. Here, the story of cultural revival led by indigenous activists splits. In one reading, supported particularly in the Taiwanese press and by activists, those indigenous, indigenous individuals returning to their hometowns to promote indigenous culture and arts faced many challenges, but ultimately went over their fellow villagers, who in turn become more proud of their heritage and empowered. In another reading, more typical of academic researchers based on interviews with mostly older villagers, uh, these indigenous elites are often viewed suspiciously, despite their idealism and good intentions as out of touch outsiders by the indigenous villagers they hope to serve. So they must work hard to win support for their projects, which ultimately are viewed either dismissively as frivolous or angrily as inaccurate. 
One reporter suggests that most of the artists who worked in these shops have only received training for a short period of time, and that they learned the skills mainly because they wanted to make a living. Therefore, the spirit of the traditional Aboriginal arts is lost in their works. These cautionary stories of the ill effects from commercializing culture are balanced out by celebratory tales of small village enterprises succeeding in both providing jobs for local residents, both Aboriginal and Chinese, while also invigorating tribal culture and promoting interest among young people in learning traditional practices. There is, of course, truth in both versions of these stories, and they reflect common perceptions of the indigenous culture industry, with participants and observers taking positions on either side. However, the story of culture loss and the multiple readings of revival don't entirely match the histories recounted to me by indigenous crafters. So, for example, while many accounts focus on the ruptures in textile practices, the weavers and embroiderers I observed and interviewed were much more likely to emphasize the connection to their family members who made similar items and whom they had watched making clothing when they were younger. Some very accomplished artists are themselves very old, having learned their crafts as young women during Japanese colonial rule. These women now serve as teachers to middle-aged and young women in the communities, but they have also passed on their interest in tribal arts to their children and close relatives. On one visit to a family-run workshop, uh, the middle-aged owner proudly pulled out the dress she wore for her traditional Paiwan wedding decades before. The dress, shown here, uh, made from a crushed blue velvet with black velvet edging and an elaborate patch of sea bead embroidery in her collar, was paired with an underskirt composed of alternating light brown, red, and green cotton panels. Certainly this dress marks some of the changes in style noted by historians of uh, indigenous clothing, including access to new materials, but it also suggests a continued, a continued fashioning of traditional attire during a period of time when it was, according to many accounts, supposed to have been abandoned. Despite this case and others, there is certainly a significant generational gap in practice, attested to by the prevalence of community classes, and these are all pictures from a community class we saw while we were doing the collection this summer, aimed at teaching basic crafting skills to middle-aged adults, and some of the people. However, many younger textile workers from various tribes now speak more of continuity in practice, having learned from the older generation, though perhaps not from their parents, and being exposed to tribal crafts from an early age. Perhaps this is evidence of the success of the revitalization movement in the 1990s, resulting in a newly constructed narrative that focuses on continuity over disruption and participation over loss. Though it is also likely that some of the ruptures or losses noted in popular and academic accounts were more a perception rather than a real disruption. So I want to turn to uh, craft industries, uh, looking at variation and innovation. Uh, specifically, I'll start with the glass beads. That's a very colorful area and something I have a lot of experience with. Uh, UMass Zinger is attributed with revitalizing Taiwan beads in the 1970s, first researching the colors and styles of beads by talking to elders and then testing out ways of making the beads. He identified 28 patterns and four single colored beads, but nobody he talked to had any knowledge of what the beads were made of. Looking at a few of his mother's beads, he assumed that since they were opaque, they must be some sort of clay. So he developed a quartz clay method to resemble the older beads. However, the Dragonfly Studio was also strongly associated with the revival of bead making, with some accounts suggesting that the husband and wife owners had to learn how to make beads from scratch. That's a quote from an article when they opened their workshop in 1983, although they were also UMass's students. Possibly this refers to their difference in material, uh, where they, they are using just glass, and method, when they use lampwork method, which is shown here. Other workshops in the area trace their bead making lineage through UMass or Dragonfly. Another Sandiman workshop, Shatao, is run by a family who originally received instruction from UMass, but now uses a glass line work technique to make both traditional and new bead creations. And then on the other side of the mountains, in Taitama City and the nearby Taimali Township, bead makers are quick to give credit to the Pindol revitalization. Uh, that's where all of these other workshops are at. 
but also emphasize the variation of meanings and meanings between communities. For highly stratified societies like the Paiwan and Rukai, revitalization of crafts not only helped to restore part of material culture that was under threat of disappearing completely, but also made it accessible to more than just the upper classes. Several Paiwan crafters, such as Sakuyo, who helped revitalize pottery in Chateau Studio, which makes glass beads, clearly state publicly that part of the significance of their work is to make it available to everyone regardless of family status or, in practice, tribal affiliation. Other crafters, while acknowledging that originally restricted craft objects are now available to everyone, uh, so long as they have money, uh, originally, then go on to re-invoke the original restrictions of particular items, such as pottery or carved sheath knives. Particular objects, they say, say, still have restrictions for being used by particular classes of people. The distinction seems to be between owning the objects and using them. For the newly learned crafts of bead making and pottery, technologies were chosen that best mimics the older material culture. In all appearances, the technologies that are used in crafting seem to be very similar, if not identical, to those used by contemporary crafters in any part of the world today. Generally, there doesn't seem to be much concern with how something is made in distinguishing crafts as indigenous, um, although there's a differentiation between handmade and manufactured. In contrast to these crafts, the plant fiber arts of shell ginger leaf, which is the picture on the top, and the pounded bark are considered indigenous expressly because they continue to use the same old techniques including the harvesting and preparation of materials. However, the end products are very different from traditional use, as one young woman who made pounded bark lamps and other household goods explained, of course we don't wear bark anymore, it's itchy. <laughs> T-shirts are much more comfortable. I want to turn now to the consistencies and variations of traditional styles between four of last few workshops, uh, Dragonfly, Chateau, Via, and Atta. And then, um, so Dragonfly provides information on 12 different multicolored beads, Chateau, lists eight, um, as well as six innovative leads. Via provides information on nine, and Ata's brochure has 22, so there's a vast variation on the, even the number of beads and the different names and the designs. And the common beads between these workshops are actually all listed here. These are all from Shatao. Um, so you have Mugi Dan, Muka Muka, which is Ivy. What's it? <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't speak the language, so. Magadzikdao. Uh, and Mananigai um, over here. Is this Kurikurao? And Palu. All right, that was hard. And you can see all of these beads in the exhibit, so don't worry about the bad image here. The variations in traditional beads, and the reason I collected so many beads from different uh, workshops is so you can compare them within the exhibit as well, so I hope you'll we'll take a chance to look at that later. Uh, the variations in traditional beads are attributed by crafters to regional and cultural variation, particularly in regards to the difference in name or meaning assigned to a particular pattern. Many of the current bead workshops had conducted their own background research either before or while setting up their bead making business. There may also be an issue of categorization. For example, Via describes uh, beads, bead types, uh, in, within subcategorizations, helping to get a class of beads at other workshops. However, it is also likely that much of the variation comes from innovation by bead makers. When asked whether one could change the designs of traditional beads, crafters at first responded in the negative, this is something that is not allowed. Then they started to elaborate that certain traditional bead patterns uh, were actually not very attractive, like the be eye bead, which was originally not very round, could be made more round, or the colors in the peacock bead, which were originally a black background with red and white feather design, could be redesigned with a more pleasing blue or green background with multicolored feathers. These changes would make the beads more beautiful, but it would not change the meaning, and it is the meaning that they say cannot be changed. These beads are, were still generally regarded as trontong, or traditional objects since they follow the, the familiar patterns and forms passed down for generations. And this is just an example of one of the very popular beads, the warrior bead. Uh, and you can see how it just, it's a very simple bead, but it still varies in the, the style, but still considered traditional. All right. However, while the meaning of traditional beads were viewed as set, this did not stop crafters from inventing new beads with new meanings. Indigenous craft workshops commonly distinguish a category of Chongshu innovative, it's Chongshu innovative, 
that are distinct from Chuangtong, traditional designs. But both of these categorizations are negotiable, varying between workshops and individuals, and making the overlap as simultaneous qualities. It could be both Chuangtong and Chuangshu at the same time. Chuangshu crafts can be uh, and adaptations of Chuangtong, either through changes in color patterns, forms, usage, or more abstractly through the ad adaptation of a traditional story or value into a new material form. But they could also be innovations without connections to pre previous indigenous art. While many beads were made simply for their aesthetic appeal and were viewed as simply creative beads, other creative beads were additionally attributed with cultural significance. For example, the six beads previously mentioned listed in Chateau's brochure, which I have up here. If you want to see these pictures better later, you can look at my computer. Um, these, these are listed as innovative wisdom in their brochures, include a translucent blue bead in the shape of a vase, decorated with a swirling motif of a hundred paste viper and white flowers, called vase life bead, with the meaning the pearl of prosperity. And these are all in English. Uh, the, the brochures have those chains in English. Or a curved, elongated pink bead with a pink flower called lily spirits, with the meaning of pearl of loyalty. The first bead refers to the connection of pottery and 100 piece fibers to Taiwan origin stories, while the second bead references the lily as a symbol of the girl's chastity. Crafters say these beads, like the 100 piece fiber bead made by Bia, shown in the intro, are designed through and down here, uh, are designed through inspiration, time, and persistence in trying to get the new design just right. One bead maker details the process of having to think rather than simply copying. I heard the sound of the waves in the evening, a really loud sound, and thought, how can I take that wave and put it in a glass bead and design the pattern? Then I kept trying to make it. When I first started, it, it likely wasn't very pretty and needed to change. I kept working on the pattern until it was right. Recently, I worked on a Pongxin uh, hollow glass bead. That's this one here. It's actually hollow inside. I went to a museum in Taipei and saw an egg carving. Inside that egg was another egg carving. So I looked at glass beads and thought, I think I could. I probably can't. I'll try and see. I worked on that for a long time, over a year. When I first started, the materials were all wrong. They kept failing. Then I tried a different kind of glass, and this worked. Such stories of crafting emphasize the moment of inspiration, often from nature, as with the way the, but also from other cultural sources, such as museums. The inspired crafter creates a design, but then spends months or years in perfecting this new style. But while the process of creation is similar for all crafters, it is the meaning attributed to the bead throughout the process that classes it within existing cultural motifs. In effect, these become new indigenous beads. So the textile artist Kalidasan from the Rukai tribe, uh, which traditionally forbade them from textile work, explains the creation of his pieces as an evolution from traditional decorations and says he has always dreamed of abstractions of traditional lines when craftsmen are usually dreaming of more concrete patterns, such as that one with a viper or a butterfly. His designs include a realistic butterfly, then just the antenna abstract, abstracted, so butterfly, antenna, and then finally, just one antenna as a nice swirly line, swirling, curving line. According to him, the butterfly represents hard work and speed. One of his most popular designs is a small pouch with butterfly antenna pattern around a flap that curves like a butterfly wing, and we have one of these in the exhibit, he, which represents his hope that the pieces will fly out the door. <laughs> Similarly, he applicates images of heads that are associated with the former practice of head hunting, but now reimagines these designs as signifying success or attainment, for example, of knowledge. His work changes every year. This applique work was a series created several years ago, and was followed by a year focusing on weavings, and this is one of these pieces, um, yeah, which are sold as large wall hangings or smaller patches to be used for furnishings. Currently, he is working on tightly wound bands of strings that were then bent into structural patterns around boxes or bags. And these bands are derived from a traditional technique of winding cords used on bags and other items. And so I didn't get a really good picture of this, but you can kind of see it here. It's just this really tightly wound uh, cord. Very pretty. <laughs> one of the most uh, so that's I need to conclude. Um, one of the most basic conclusions I hope everyone 
draws from these stories and discussions is that creativity and indigeneity are not antithetical to one another. Partially, this requires moving away from common assumptions of what creativity is. The recent theories of creativity have been very careful to acknowledge the diversity of forms and perceptions of creative processes and the relation of creativity to society and the individual. While the popular perception of creativity is that of the individual that comes up with an idea, these studies show the significance of society in framing and encouraging creativity both within individuals and as a collective effort. And yet despite these studies, there is still a tendency to view creativity as detri detrimental to indigenous cultures. I suggest that part of the difficulty lies in perceptions of indigenous identity as founded on the concept of tradition that is uh, ancient and unchanging. However, as previously discussed, the artists I work with make a distinction between things that are traditional and things that are indigenous. Not all things that are indigenous are considered traditional. Indigenous things and people can also be modern and innovative. As many artists conveyed in various forms, tradition is the past, culture is how you live, but being indigenous is all of these things. However, this formulation creates another dichotomy, that tradition is one thing and creative creativity is another, or put another way, that tradition is not creative. Um, while these two qualities are often posed as contradictory, they are also depicted in intimate relations. For example, when artists discuss their creative reshaping of traditional colors and styles into new traditional objects, or when new objects are made with reference to traditional stories, 